Most of you, I hope, are familiar with the, the Way We Green and the work the city's been undertaking over the last eight months to create our community's long-term environmental strategic plan. We've had workshops with a wide variety of stakeholder groups throughout the community. I recognize some of the people here from our workshops. We've compiled a remarkable collection of discussion papers on a variety of environmental subjects, including the subject we're going to be hearing about today. We visited many public events and gathered the thoughts and opinions of citizens, and we sought the advice and guidance of an expert panel of advisors. But one of the most enjoyable aspects of our creating the plan has been hearing from the, uh, firsthand from the experts. In some case, cases, this has meant hosting video interviews on our website, but every once in a while we get lucky and we're able to have an expert come and speak to us personally. That's why we're so pleased when we found today's speaker was in town and willing and come to talk to us. Craig Applegath is an architect, urban designer, and a partner at Dialogue, an integrated design firm with studios in Vancouver, Edmonton, Calgary, and Toronto. Craig is a founder, founding member of ResilientCity.org, a nonprofit network of architects, urban planners, engineers, and landscape architects. This organization is founded on developing creative, practical, and implementing planning and design strategies that address the future problems that we will face as humans as we deal with the impacts of climate change and energy transition. Craig uh, graduated from Harvard with a Master's of Architecture and Urban Design. Since that time, he's built a considerable track record for leading complex planning and design projects, but is best known for his advocacy of green building design. In addition to his project and design responsibility, Craig lectures on sustainable design and resilient city planning in Canada and the United States. He's a founding board member of Sustainable Buildings Canada and a past president of the Ontario Association of Architects. In 2001, Craig was made a fellow of the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada for his services to the profession. We're very pleased to have him with us today. Will you please join me in welcoming Craig Applegath. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. And when you um, said I was an expert, if you had been referring to me being an urban designer or an architect, I might have felt comfortable. But being an expert in, in resiliency is a bit uncomfortable because really the study of resiliency is something that's in its infancy and really has been discussed by people interested in around the world for only about two or three years. So in my presentation today, understand I'm coming to you as someone bringing some ideas to the table for discussion as opposed to an expert telling you what you should do. One of the things you heard Harvey say as well is that I'm an architect and partner at Dialogue. And you probably thought, what's that? So I thought I should give you a sense or tell you what that is. It is the recent merger of Kohas Evami, Hudson Bakker, Bonifaz Had. Mole White, an office for urbanism, uh, four of Canada's most creative uh, architecture, engineering, and design firms. And we just launched our new brand this past week. Very excited about it. And to give you a sense of, for, for those of you that aren't familiar with the architecture and, and urban design engineering business, some of the projects we're responsible for in Edmonton include uh, Nate HP Center, uh, the University of Alberta's uh, uh, National Institute of Nanotechnology, uh, the Royal Alexandra Robbins Pavilion, and of course the beautiful Winspear Center, just kitty corner to us here. What I guess um, indicated to the city that I might have some expertise in resiliency was this website that uh, a few of us put together about a year ago because we were interested in resiliency and its impact on city making and building making, landscape design, architecture, and so forth. And there wasn't a lot of information in the world about what resilient cities were or could be, so we started asking questions. So we have a lot of questions. We don't have a lot of answers, but we have a lot of questions. And one of the things we're just completing right now is an international design ideas competition for um, ideas related to creating more resilient cities. And we've just received about 54 competition entries and we're about to judge them. Very, very exciting. They're actually on the website. Uh, um, lots of um, interesting ideas about what will make cities more resilient. Today's talk has a very simple agenda. 
I'd like to just try and get at what resilience is. I'd like to answer the question, why should Edmonton care about resilience? Why, why should you think this is the least bit important? How is capacity for resilience created? What are the opportunities to build resilience, and specifically in Edmonton? Which opportunities might you want to consider starting with as you build resiliency? And a summary of key takeaway ideas. That says there will be no miracles here. As I said at the beginning, this is more about asking questions about how to make our cities more resilient as opposed to uh, providing answers. And uh, when I told one of my Edmonton partners um, that I was going to be writing a paper on resilience and coming out and speaking to uh, you here, he said, what? Someone from Toronto coming out to tell Edmonton about resilience? Wasn't Toronto the city that 10 years ago had three extra inches of snow and called out the armed forces to shovel it? <laughs> so as I said, we'll be asking more questions and providing answers. Well, what's resilience? If you go on to uh, Wikipedia, Wikidictionary, this is the definition for resilience. The, the mental ability to recover quickly from depression, illness, or misfortune. Uh, two, the physical property of material that can resume its shape after being stretched or deformed. Um, three, the positive ability of a system or company to adapt itself to the consequence of catastrophic failure caused by power outage of fire, bomb, or similar particular IT systems. I think there's probably a definition that's a, is a little closer to what we're interested in today, uh, put forward by um, uh, Bruce Walker in his uh, paper, Resilience, Adaptability, and Transform Transformability in Social Ecological Systems. It's a paper on ecology. He says, resilience is the capacity of a system to absorb disturbance and re reorganize while undergoing change so as to still remain essentially the same function, structure, identity, and feedbacks. In other words, as you um, stress or shock a system, its ability to come back and not be destroyed and its, its, its underlying functions to be continuous. Who cares? Why, why, why should we care about this? Why is this important? Um, I think in the past, a lot of discussions about making a city more green focus around the term sustainability. And sustainability really is about our world going forward in a way that we don't take out of it more than it's able to give, that we don't destroy the world, the, the natural world's ability to provide what are called natural services to us. It's also a moral issue. I mean, how much can we do to the world? What is appropriate? So that's all about what we are doing to the world, the harm we're doing to the world in most cases. Resilience starts to look at not what we're doing to the world, but what the world in return is going to do to us. So a few questions in terms of why you might care about resilience. What happens if H1N1 or avian flu pandemic hits? What does the city do? How does the city prepare for something like that? Taxes go up and services and spending go down. China's economy does what Japan's did 10 years ago in craters. It's not buying lots of oil, it's not buying potash, it's not buying minerals. Oil goes to $250 a barrel forever. Climate change happens faster than expected. By the way, these aren't my questions. These were questions from a um, professor of business at Queens that I saw a presentation of a, a little while ago. These were his questions that he was putting forward to the business community advocating that businesses start to look at resilience as being a very important part of how they move forward in the future. Not all risks can be managed. Often when we're talking about managing risks, we're thinking about risks where we can understand an outcome. If you do X, Y, and Z, you will accomplish the outcome you want to. But the reality is, in a city, risks are far more complicated so that there may be a range of futures that you're trying to deal with, or true ambiguity. You may not actually know what outcomes are going to be out there. So I think when we're starting to talk about dealing with the future, we can't plan for any specific risk. We have to start to look at building resilience into the system so that different sorts of stresses and shocks can occur, and the city as a system and its many subsystems will be able to withstand it. Everyone recognizes his ship, and that was the quote of the captain of that ship before it sailed. I cannot imagine any condition 
which would cause this ship to founder. I cannot conceive of any vital disaster happening to this vessel. Modern shipbuilding has gone beyond that. There's a large contingent in any organization, any city, that believes that the status quo will continue to work, that just don't monkey around too much with it, things will be okay, all of the kind of concerns that are brought to, the, to bear on a problem, eh, don't worry about it. Well, you know what happened to the ship. But for cities, resilience to what? What, what does a city like Edmonton want to be thinking about in terms of building resilience? Resilience to what? Cities around the world over the next 20 to 50 years are going to have to be thinking about building into their systems now, while there are still the resources to do it, while we still at least know we have resources to do it, three big risks, three big potential sources of stresses and shocks to city systems. One is population change. There's a three billion people are gonna be added to the planet over the next 50 years. Climate change. We don't know what the outcomes of climate change are, but we know that over the next 50 years, the planet will warm about two degrees. And probably the most contentious one, at least here in Alberta, is peak oil, whether or not it really exists. But the consensus is that irrespective of its impacts, oil, the actual world supply of oil in the ground, is going to peak somewhere over the next 20 years. So what kind of stresses, shocks, do those three things potentially visit upon a city? Well, increased populations brings with it potential for disease, pandemics, and the spread of pandemics. Migration, that picture in the middle is a, a picture uh, off the CBC website a year ago when the first Tamil ship was landing in BC. And consumption, huge increased numbers of people means increased consumption and the impact that has on both economies and countries. Climate change. Don't need to say too much more about this. It's in the news all the time. Um, I noticed in the Globe and Mail uh, yesterday, or the, I guess the day before, there was an article about the Arctic ice. The hope had been that it would be reforming as it used to. No, it is melting. It continues to melt at higher rates than anticipated. What are the big, three of the big things that will affect cities? Drought extreme weather and flooding. As you pump more energy into the system, um, in some areas you'll have more drought, in some areas you'll have more flooding, and certainly you'll have a higher number, higher frequency of what are called extreme weather events, and you have higher energy in those weather events. Peak oil. Peak oil means fuel costs go up, power costs go up, even if it's not power associated with oil. As any one fuel price goes up, it tends to drive the other types of fuel um, and energy costs up, and food costs go up. Um, food is produced um, in majority now around the world in industrial farming uh, context and requires huge inputs of oil, uh, not only in the production of fertilizer, but in the mechanization of, of the uh, farming industry now. 